Good morning. In Matthew 16, Jesus was speaking to Peter as well as to each one here this morning. And he told Peter, he said, Peter, I will build my church. Turn to Matthew 16. Let's read a few verses. Matthew 16, uh, we're going to end up in Acts, but we're going to start here in Matthew 16 just for a few verses. I'd like to read verses six, uh, 13 through 20 to get the setting here. When Peter, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And here verse 18 is where I would like to draw from just for a few minutes. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the heaven, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Jesus said, I will build my church. Now if we go back two and a half weeks, I believe it was, we had business meeting here. And uh, we were talking about a new uh, roof on our church. And we had discussion about that, and I thought it went quite smoothly. Is, is that what Jesus was referring to? You know, I think we're aware, although he was referring to a building, although he said, I will build, he was not referring to a clean red brick church with pews and ample Sunday school rooms. I think it goes further than that. The word church means call out a gathering, a popular assembly, a popular meeting, or an assembly. So church means, for example, it's a town meeting in Ephesus, which was called out. It was an only an official citywide meeting. And that's what they called, that's what the church was referring to. So we could ask the question, what is the difference between such secular gatherings and the church that Jesus said he is going to build? We're gathered here this morning in what we are calling church. But what was Jesus referring to when he was saying to Peter, to Peter, I am going to build my church. The difference is that God calls and God gathers his church. His church is the body of believers, the people who were called out of the world by him. We talked about this morning in our Sunday school lesson, but the people you're referring to are his sanctified people, set apart for him. That's the church that he is building. This morning we're gathered in a building but what Jesus was referring to in Matthew 16 was the blood-washed saints, the souls of those who have been born again. Jesus says, I will build my church. I'm going to build a body of blood-washed people who have been born again, and they will take my word to the uttermost parts of the earth. So this morning, if you're one of those people, you have been called out by Jesus Christ, and you're part of his church. We have been called out of darkness and invited or ushered into his what? His marvelous light. And today we are functioning as part of the church of God. When he, when he told Peter, he said, I will build my church on this rock. He was not referring to Peter as a foundation rock, which the church will be built upon. I think we're all quite aware of that as well. But rather to himself, the, the Messiah, the true Son of God that Jesus earlier had confessed Jesus to be. So if you can picture yourself there when in Matthew uh, 16, Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter, and he was correct. And then Jesus pointed to himself and he said, upon this rock I will build my church. So this morning our church is founded on a solid rock, which is Jesus Christ. He promised he will build his church, which is exciting. Then he also leaves us with yet another promise. He says, the gates of hell will not overpower my church. So you're here this morning, and you can leave, that should comfort each one of us. 
we're worshiping God this morning, and the world outside, the evils among us, are not going to overpower us. The gates of hell symbolize the organized powers of the enemies of Jesus Christ. The organized powers of Christ's enemies. They're not going to overpower the church of God. The church that Jesus is building will be able to endure the, all the attacks that the enemies will bring. So we go back to the foundation of the church, which is who? It's Jesus Christ. And he is stronger than the power of Satan, which is the master of this present world. The church may be small. At times we may feel like we're losing the battle. And even though we will be ridiculed, even though at times that you will be opposed, even though at times we will be despised by our enemies, the fact remains the church of God will continue on. Not that we're here losing hope or, losing, or living in fear by the church of God. But the church of God will prevail. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Nations may rise and nations may fall. Great leaders will come and great leaders will go. But the church of Christ will continue on. Along with those who are part of the people that God has called out. So as part, as a body of believers here at Marystown, we're part of of the family of God. We're part of the body of Christ. Now it's time for a few questions as we think about the church this morning. Did you ever wonder if us, if here at Myerstown, if we are, can I say it, doing church, if we're doing church the way God originally attended for his church to function? This morning, we gathered. Nate led us in some singing. We had a Sunday school devotional. We had a Sunday school lesson. We had a short devotional, announcements, and now we're here. Is this what God originally had intended? Did you ever stop and think, are we doing church the way God wants us to do church? Okay, that's a few more questions. How do we rate in God's eyes? If we were graded, what would be our grade? Let's look at us personally. What is my part of the church? And ask ourselves a question, am I doing my part? Is God pleased with my role here at church? There's 147 people here this morning. Is God pleased with me? Did I come this morning with the correct attitude? Am I here this morning to serve, to worship? Is God pleased with the reason I am here? Are we assisting the Lord in building his church? So an employee of a company is normally watched or occasionally observed to see how, how well they're doing their job. You know, they check their performance, his or her, yeah, they're doing well, and sometimes pay raises are given. At church, we're not paid based on performance. But I trust that you came here this morning with a desire to please the Lord and to assist the Lord in building his church and his kingdom. More questions. Another question. There's a couple more. Am I, am I pleasing the Lord with my involvement at church? So no, you're not gonna, we're not going to get paid based on our performance, but that's besides the point. By me being here this morning, by you being here this morning, are you pleasing the Lord with your role? Another question to consider, to ponder. Have we here at Myerstown strayed away from God's original design for his church? Or the flip, the, the flip side of the question is, are we right on track doing exactly as God had planned? I asked someone that this week, and the, the answer I got was from a dear wife. She says, well, I don't think we're too far off if we are. And I, I agree with her. But you ever think about it? A fact we all know, in, in Lancaster, Lebanon counties, I'll pick on our, our local counties here, there's a, a, can I use the word, smorgasbord of churches. We're, we're well aware of that. And if I can say it this way, there's every shape, size, and style, if, if we can look at it that way. But we're not here this morning looking at the other churches. The question we need to consider is, are we here at Myerstown in line with God's original design for his church? And I'm not here indicating we strayed or we wandered away. And we're on the straight, we're off, you know, we're off in left field somewhere. 
But just think about it a little bit. You, you, we're all part here. Did you ever stop and think, well, God, is this what you had planned? Then we could ask the question, the question could be asked, well, okay, I, I get your point, Leon, but then what is God's picture for his church? And the, the answer to that I have, I could, is, uh, was it the way the early church was in Acts 2? And you're thinking, time out. It's not wise to compare yourselves among ourselves. Amen. I agree with that. But sometimes we can, learn, we can look at somebody else's uh, example, illustration, and learn from that. So here we go. Turn to Acts 2. Let's read a few verses from Acts 2. If you're in Acts 2, go to verse 41. We'll jump in at 41 and read to verse 47. This is the early church. Then they gladly received his word and were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking the bread from house to house, did eat meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved. Now just stop for a moment. Let that sink in about what that church looked like. And is that where we are at this morning? Notice a few key phrases in what I just read. Gladly received his word, continued steadfastly in doctrine and fellowship. All that believed had all things in common, continued daily with one accord, praising God and having favor with all the people. I guess the purpose this morning is to help us look at this early church and wisely compare how are we doing church, and then we're going to look at um, what the Bible says about how God's intent for church to function. A couple of things, points there at the end. I repeat, I'm not here this morning saying that we are wrong because I'm part of this, we're doing our, our best, but let's just look at what God designed for us to look like. We all have our uh, kind of a picture in our mind what we think life should look like. Brother Alex admitted what he thinks a certain home should look like. He approached that cautiously. And we all have varied opinions. But what's God's opinion about how we are during church? What's God's original design? And here we see uh, these verses show uh, traits that characterize the daily life of the early believers. So the first one we want to look at is the early believers were a people who received the word gladly. So following a Pentecost and the, the baptizing of believers... Uh, that occurred at the time, the church grew rapidly. In verse 41, we see there were 3,000 people added to the church. So the early church was in the beginning stages. And their very first trait that was listed is very commendable. They gladly received the word of God. The, this church was not building on man's ideas, nor on man's thoughts, but only but on God's word. They received the word, meaning they welcomed the word of God. They believed it. They practiced it. They had a hunger for more. And at the same time, they were sharing the word of God, this, uh, the gospel. This church was alive. Moving on, they continued steadfastly. Okay. Now, the, uh, the, the time of the Acts that we read from was before the New Testament was written. The earliest letter from the apostles, most likely Galatians, which Drew read from a little bit ago, didn't appear until two decades after the birth of the early church here at, at Pentecost. But we see the, the church eagerly accepted the apostle teaching on Jesus of Nazareth and the promised Messiah. But what were they studying? What did they have to read? The Old Testament. I'm not here again, that's, the Old Testament's great. We can learn a lot from that. But their Bible was the Old Testament supplemented by what Christ had taught them. So what does the Bible tell us? They continued steadfastly, means to adhere to, to persist in, or to devote oneself to someone or something. Are we continuing steadfastly? It represents a pathway of spiritual health and spiritual growth. So they took the word that was being taught and also the Old Testament, and they based their belief upon that, 
and continued in that. Uh, are we devoting ourselves to God's word? And when we do so, we will grow in our spiritual life. The early church heard the gospel message uh, from the, uh, and the teaching from the apostles, and they clung to it. And what I see here is a, a group of dedicated believers. Now, a quote from the book, The Anabaptist Vision, we're talking about the early Anabaptists. I quote, They were so drawn unto God, they knew nothing, sought nothing, cherished nothing, loved nothing, but God alone. So we go back to our early Anabaptists, our early uh, founders of our faith, we could call them. They were so drawn unto God that they knew, sought, cherished, and loved nothing but God alone. And that's what we were talking about here this morning. There I see a sign of steadfastness. Nothing more important than God alone and his word. Do are we taking the word of God? We have the New Testament on our laps. We're blessed. Are we taking that and clinging and adhering to that and continuing steadfastly in the word of God? The early believers were de a devoted people who were eager to learn. They persevered in do doctrine, in fellowship, in the Lord's Supper, and in prayer. Let's look at them briefly in doctrine. They were record keepers of the early doctrine which they heard from the apostles. And that, they kept record of that and that formed a benchmark against which a Christian faith and practice was measured. So they took what they were taught and applied it and set a guideline for that. And I, I, where would you and I be this morning if we wouldn't have the New Testament? I don't want to uh, think about that. But the early believers held fast to the teaching of and the doctrine and instructions from the apostles. They took what they had, were, were hearing and clung to it. Today, we too can be saved and are saved, rooted and grounded in the very same message that they received. For we have the same doctrine, the same teaching instructions that they had. A verse from Titus 1.9, Holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. And I ask this question, are we holding fast to sound doctrine? When we think how the early, the early church continued steadfastly in doctrine, and then we'll look at fellowship here in a minute, and the question for us, are we clinging to, holding fast, adhered to sound doctrine? And we're in a world where things are spinning. Where are we? Where are we at? Ask yourself the question, are you, am I, holding fast to sound doctrine? Verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And then it says, and in a fellowship. Fellowship means oneness or commonality, true community. Now, possibly as, as I read these verses, you gather what this church was like. But I see a body of believers functioning together. And we're going to look at that as we go through here this morning. But oneness and true community, they continued steadfast in fellowship. What I see here is a picture of unity, of harmony, along with the ability to function together as a body, as one unit. So this morning, you're sitting here. I mentioned there's 147 people here for us to count it correctly. Look around you this morning. And what you're going to see, according to the church calendar, you're going to see approximately 25 different last names this morning. You don't have to count, but approximately 25 different last names. You'll see approximately 40 married couples. So times two is 80 families represented. You're going to see, give or take, 20 singles. I think there's got more here than that. Plus a number of children, all together from various families, uh, bringing together our strong points, our goals, and our talents, and our abilities together to form one body of believers, fellowshipping and worshiping together under one roof in oneness and true community. And this morning, that's what we call fellowship. A wide range of people coming together for one purpose. And I believe that this is how God intended his church to function. Many people, here we see in the early church, 3,000, today we have 147, coming together and functioning together as one unit. 
I mentioned 40 married couples, okay? We are at this point, sometime along the line, we were newlyweds. So sometimes newlyweds need to work their way through differences as they begin their new home. Please don't raise your hand. One spouse may feel, well, it should be done this way. Other spouse may say, well, in our house, this is how we did it. So they need to work together and the two need to work out their differences. So let's take the one couple, two people, and take that times 50, which I mentioned earlier approximately, and then we remember that that's God's plan for his church, that we function together with unity and pure, unselfish fellowship. Is that the church that Jesus said he is going to build? So this morning, as I was looking across, we have a, a number of visitors and we welcome each one of you with open arms. Now to the members here, if you're feeling brave this morning, after church is over here in a couple, another half hour or so, um, ask a visitor if they're experiencing this type of fellowship while they're worshiping here with us. Or maybe you want to just strike up a conversation and say, why are you here? Be careful with that. Make sure you ask that kindly because, we, like I said, we welcome each one. And why do you keep coming back? What do you see here that you like or appreciate? So the one question is, do they feel God-approved community here at Myerstown? Gary Miller, in his book, Church Matters, I quote, God desires that people looking at our churches will see something so compelling, so powerful, so earth-shatteringly different from anything else that they immediately sense God's presence. Ask your visitors that one. Is that what they see? Is that why they keep coming back? To those visitors here, in case you didn't realize that, we're far from perfect, but we're having a good fun time. The word the fellowship that we're looking at here this morning is only possible when the, when the presence and love of God is abiding in our hearts. Or not, this cannot happen without the presence of God. Fellowship without the presence of God is impossible. And you can say, why? Because fellowship, and this is a quote, and I'm not sure where I found it, my apologies. Fellowship is spiritual participation that is based upon a spiritual union wrought by the Spirit of God. Fellowship is a spiritual participation that is based upon a spiritual union that's wrought by the Spirit of God. So you take God out of the picture and fellowship is gone. We need him to work it all out. Through the spirit of God, believers come one in life and one in purpose. And that's why we can sit here this morning and fellowship. That's why I believe back on July 13th when we talked about spending a large sum of money to replace a church roof, no one talked. Everyone was okay. It needs to be done. I saw a lot of unity. And I'll be honest, I was a little surprised. I expect some people were going to say some things and nobody said anything. Beautiful. What did Jesus say? I will build my church. Believers um, have a joint life as we share, we share our, our blessings, our needs, and our gifts together. Oftentimes done in, in the Sunday school uh, setting as we just discuss things together. Fellowship forbids an unattached Christian life. The, the, the believer's fellowship is maintained because why? Excuse me. We continue steadfastly in Scripture and in worship with others of like precious faith. We're not unattached. We're attached to the body. The word fellowship paints a beautiful picture of God's design for his church. Now, I'm spending a lot of time on this, on this one word fellowship here, but I think it's so, so beautiful. And I feel it here. I trust that your answers you'll get from your visitors later on is the same so the unity of fellowship is carried over into verse 45, where we see it illustrated in a way the early Christians shared their possessions. So we ask the question, we get to the end of this one, end of fellowship, are you experiencing true fellowship here at Myerstown, and are we doing our part to continue painting this picture? Are you, am I, are we doing our part? The Bible tells us in verse uh, 42, they continued steadfastly in breaking the bread, which was the Lord's Supper. Fellowship carried over, and unity carried over into the breaking of bread as they uh, celebrated the Lord's Supper in anticipation for the day they would celebrate it with Jesus in his kingdom. And today, 
uh, every time we have counsel, the, the questions go out, do you have confessed peace with God and your fellow men? And the reason we, that is done uh, is so we don't take, partake unworthily and hinder the peace and harmony in the brotherhood. And also we see they continue steadfastly in breaking the bread. We see that the fact that the early church celebrated the Lord's Supper uh, so often reveals their levels of love and harmony that the church was experiencing. And I trust that's where you are at here this morning. Do you look forward to our next communion service? Is that something you look forward to? Are you experiencing the level of love and unity the early church was experiencing? Moving on, they continued breaking the bread and in prayers, in prayer. You've heard it said that a family that prays together stays together. And I believe that's the same way in uh, the church family. There was a special time of prayer and singing here on Wednesday evening uh, here at Myerstown. But the believers in the early church, they were people who persevered in prayer. And the idea there was church prayer united together with an entire body of believers. They were they brought into the most intimate fellowship and the presence of God through prayer. It appears they could get no closer to God than what they were when that's, they were drawn nigh to him through prayer. And we're not told how often, it says they continued steadfastly in prayer. We're not told how often they had their prayer meetings, but it does appear that they, put, they placed a high value on spending time together praying. Prayer should not be a response to crisis or needs, but rather, to everyone here this morning, prayer should be a significant, significant part of the community life of our church family. So we ask the question, is our life, prayer life, well-pleasing to the Lord? Am I spending ample time in prayer? Verse 44, and all that believe were together had all things common. We discussed the meaning of the word fellowship, now we see another phrase. They were together and had all things common, meaning they were in the same place because they were of the same calling, in the same mind, the same priorities, and the same purpose. And I, I know I mentioned unity in this early church. Uh, I mentioned this before, but this is it's commendable. The faith in Christ, Jesus Christ, resulted in a spiritual unity one that expresses itself in the complete sharing of natural resources. Sold their possessions and goods and poured it unto all men as every man had need. I don't think the word, the phrase, this is mine, was ever voiced. They had all things common. What's yours is mine. They were all striving together for one common goal. It goes on, verse 46, they continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Again, the emphasis is on functioning together as a unified body. So let's think a little bit about uh, the bones and the muscles in, in our bodies. You know, both are required uh, to make the body function properly. Try to imagine how I would move about up here if I was missing one or the other. And I think we understand it would be impossible. Every time your arm moves or your leg moves, what's happened is a, a muscle is pulling one way while it's being resisted by, by the bone. And the net result is, is movement. Every time we move around, our muscles are moving and our bones are saying, you can only go so far. And assuming that the brain is, coordinates things properly, every action is functional to the body. So think about what's happening this morning when you raise your arm. What you're doing is you're observing the wonder of bone and muscle working together to create movement. You don't even think about it very often because you, just, you just, just do things. But bone and muscle are moving together and you're creating uh, movement. Now think, think of your bone. It's rigid, hard, and unyielding. And the muscle is the exact opposite. Flexible, willing to stretch or strain. So if I, if I reach for that glass of water, my muscles go out. And they keep on wanting to go further, but my bone says, nope, that's all the further you can go. But at the same time, both are needed, both are working together and to function, and so we can move. Like I said, without one or the other, we couldn't, we couldn't function. Bones in themselves have, have no power. Uh, you see a skeleton, 
Uh, I drive to work, and somewhere down 897, down close to Gaiman School, by the way, there's some man who thinks it's funny to set skeletons out and put different signs there to uh, create humor, I guess, and he has a bunch of skeletons he sets out there. Uh, but bones and skeletons themselves, they're, they're incapable of movement. Wherever he sets them in the morning, they're the same place in the evening. Yet both bones and muscles are important for smooth function. A body without bones would be unable to support itself, but at the same time, our, our bones provide the stability that we need to accomplish our task. So we need both the bone and the muscle to function. Why did I say that? Well, God placed in the early church and in our church here this morning people with different personality traits, nat different natural abilities. Some of us come with strong points. Some come with weaknesses. And what happens is while working together smoothly, just as our body does with our bones and our muscles. And you, if, if you could, which you cannot, Look at a muscle this morning, you'd say, well, you know, like I mentioned, it's, it's flexible and it strains. And you look at a bone, you drop it, it would clunk on the, on, on the pulpit. Opposites. But guess what? When both are working together, you have a smooth body motion. In the same way, within the church. Working together to build God's church, which is the body of Christ. What did the early church do? They continued daily, day after day, in one accord. The same way at... I feel things are going here at church. Are we working together in a smooth way in one accord? They also say they break in bread. Verse 47, praising God. And just take note of their worship. They, they were worshiping in the temple, uh, praying and attending regular, regular hours of worship and prayer, worshiping in their homes. They said they moved from house to house. They were sharing in, in fellowship meals, observing the Lord's Supper, remembering his death. They were worshiping with gladness and singleness of heart. Singleness, singleness means sincere without hardness. So we picture their hearts being soft, tender, and easily touched. What was their attitude? I mentioned earlier our attitude for coming this morning. Their attitude was filled with, with joy, gladness, and rejoicing. It's just where we are at this morning. And they were more than willing to worship and minister as the Lord instructed. And what happened? The results were twofold. They gained favor with the people, and the Lord added, added to the church daily such as should be saved. Their, their unity of their spirit was clearly expressed with their desire to be together. And I, I also feel that here this morning. Whether they were worshiping in the temple or sharing meals in each other's homes, this infant church was characterized by a joy that could do nothing than attract others. And that's exactly what it did. So as the numbers were increasing, we do well to remember that the Lord was behind it all. The Lord was uh, bringing souls into the church so they too could experience his saving grace. And I, I believe this morning that these verses, they give us God's ideal desire for the church that Jesus said he is going to build. And what I see is the early church, and could we say shouting, with the importance of unity, harmony, oneness, walking and working together, and the result is drawing souls into God's kingdom. All, the entire body there, 3,000 souls, pressing forward with one goal in mind. And the Bible says they were together with one accord. That's a beautiful picture of what Christ said, I will build my church. And I believe that's the desire that he had for that, that we just strive together with one goal in mind. The New Testament church calls the church to be characterized by, and I said we're going to look at some the way God had designed it. A few verses here I'm going to give out. Uh, just the, the New Testament church calls us to be characterized by sound doctrine. We can find that in Titus 2.1. It calls us to be characterized by fellowship. And yes, we, we saw it here in Hebrews, but there's other places we can see that. I'm sorry, in Acts. But fellowship from Hebrews 10, 25. From, in breaking bread, the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 34. In prayer, Colossians 4, 2. In holy fear, Hebrews 12, 28 and 29. Unity, Romans 15, 5 and 6. I'm going to read them verses. Now the God... Uh, patience 
and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward the other according to the G- to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's God's desire for the church? That you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. And there we see again, like-minded body pressing forward. We're also to be characterized by caring for the needs of other believers. 1 John 3, 17. We're to be characterized by obedience. Hebrews 5, 9 and Acts 6, 7. By grateful praise, Colossians 3, 16 and 17. And public favor, 1 Timothy 3, 7. God's design and order for his church. Then we could also compare the function of the church to our our four-part singing. A little bit ago, and and here shortly, the men are going to sing the bass and the tenor parts, and the ladies are going to sing the soprano and the alto. And all four parts are going to blend together in song, and what's the result? Beautiful harmony. And it's the same way the church combines talents and abilities and, and church work And what's the result? An Acts 2 church. Just functioning as God designed. The question we could ask, what kind of music is our church producing? Is it beautifully blending four-part harmony that's pleasing to the ears of the Lord? Is that what he sees coming from the church? Another question you could ask a visitor in a few minutes. I take this from Gary Miller's book, Church Matters. I quote, as honest seekers... Listen to the music floating from the daily lives of our congregation. Are they attracted to the harmony or repelled by conflicting notes? I have my answer for that, and I trust you do too. Check with the visitors. Are they attracted to the harmony or repelled by conflicting notes? If you take a a six-minute drive north, you will come to a church called Harmony Christian Fellowship. And as far as I know, there is harmony there. As far as I know, I don't know much about the church. But the question is, can people here at Myerstown sense and feel harmony, unity, and commonality at our services? Is that what they're feeling here this morning? Is that maybe, I'm kind of singling out the visitors, but even us members, is that what keeps us coming back? Are we working with Jesus Christ to build his church according to his original design. This morning, we, one of the songs that we were singing, we are one in the bond of love. John 13, 35, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if ye have love one for another. And we know the Bible tells us love will cover a multitude of sins, but are we, is that love here? And then flowing out from that, would be the unity and the harmony and the oneness and the commonality that Christ has desired. Jesus said, Matthew 16, I will build my church. I close with a question. Are you and I working together to further his work, his church, and his kingdom? That's Paul's for prayer. Lord, we come before you this morning. Just thank you for the example of the Acts 2 church there that we could look at. And I pray, Lord, that that common thread could be felt here at Myerstown. I pray for each one here this morning that we could keep coming back because of that unity and harmony that is among us. I pray, Lord, you will continue to work through and in us and help us, Lord, just to strive to be the church that you want us to be, not for our honor and glory, but for yours alone, O oh God. Thank you for each one here this morning. Bless each one for coming out. Dismiss us with your blessing. Help us, Lord, to to press on through our lives one day at a time, serving you faithfully, letting our light shine, and trust that people looking in can see the true harmony that is flowing, floating from our church here. Thank you again for the Church of Marystown. Bless each one for coming and be with us as we go about our week. In your name we pray. Amen. Nate, can we give a song, please?